The last person I'm going to talk about here is Christopher Leffingwell. He was not a card-carrying member of the Sons of Liberty, but was a very patriotic affiliate of the group. He was a major entrepreneur, a civic leader, um, and, uh, and someone who played a very important role with the Committee of Correspondence efforts, especially when it came to the outbreak of war after April 19th. Because the day after, on April 20th, 1775, a letter was delivered to him by a gentleman named Israel Bissell, who gall galloped into Norwich on horseback carrying this exact letter that said the American Revolution has officially underway. Hostilities have broken out on the Lexington Green, and Israel Bissell traveled through all throughout different towns, galloping his way, delivering these, delivering these Lexington alarm letters, as they're called. According to the American Antiquarian Society, only three of these letters are known to survive. This is one of them, the one that was sent to Christopher Leffingwell in Norwich. We were able to find the letter. It's in the collection of the Scottish Rite Masonic Museum in Lexington, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And they very generously lent us the letter in 2019. We were able to unveil it on April 20th, the day it was originally delivered, 200, like 40 some odd years later after the fact. I don't think the letter had even been in the house since it was originally written. Really an amazing. The other neat thing about that letter, it was printed, it was written on paper, manufactured by Christopher Leffingwell. <laughs> his, water, his watermark was on it. He was a major businessman and, um, and conducted a lot of different types of businesses, including starting Connecticut's first paper mill in 1766, Connecticut's first chocolate mill in 1770, and by the middle of the war, he was involved in a number of privateering uh, ventures, just like uh, Benedict Arnold was, and many others for that matter. Um, Christopher Leffingwell had the best sense of humor you could ever imagine. I wish I could have known this guy in real life. Um, he wrote this letter to a, to a, a colleague of his, and uh, they, some wires got crossed, and they took out two insurance policies on the same ship, and they were only supposed to have one. <laughs> and so he wrote to his friend and said, I'm very sorry you had not made inquiry at all your insurance offices before you ordered me to write to New York. We must now make the best we can of a bad bargain. Don't know that you have anybody to blame but yourself for this mistake. <laughs> he, he does not mince words in, in the slightest. He was a massive patriot and uh, was a militia colonel. He did not actually fight on the battlefield, but he played an active role behind the scenes in Norwich. He was a city council member. He, uh, he was elected to the General Assembly on three separate occasions. And at the end of one of those legislative session, sessions, he wrote another letter in which he said this, thus ended the October session, very little good done and very little evil prevented. <laughs> this is in 1783. Incidentally, not that no, n nothing has changed in government. <laughs> Am I right? Christopher also played a big intelligence role where he writes to General Washington back and forth about various activity he's witnessing in the New York region. So again, nobody's sitting still during this time. Nobody's sitting still. They're, move, they're always moving. They're either writing letters, they're actually talking with individuals. They are always coordinating so that they could at least have some type of advantage over the enemy. And I've said this before in other presentations. I'll say it now. We were never going to beat the British on the battlefield just based on pure military might. They had much better weapons. They had much better training. They had much better manpower than we, than we did. But we could outlast them if we were smart and if we knew how to conduct ourselves. Because they're the invading army. They have to bring in supplies. They have to keep the effort going. We just have to defend ourselves. So we were never going to beat them on the battlefield, but we could ultimately outlast them. So what legacy do the Sons of Liberty and their respective affiliates leave us? They really leave us a sense of patriotism, but also a big sense of how you organize yourself as a, uh, as a group of people that are all working towards a common goal. John Durkee passes away in 1782. As I mentioned, he is injured at the Battle of Monmouth. He was still involved with intelligence gathering, as 